Hello and welcome to the Society of Walton Scientists webinar series. We're so glad that everyone could join us today. My name is Jen Favela and I'm pleased to be today's moderator. I'm a senior Welton scientist at Welton Studies and Solutions in Gainesville, Virginia, and I've been in consulting for 11 years. I have a background in oil and gas and commercial and residential development. So we're excited to share today's e-learning experience for everyone to stay engaged virtually and continue earning education credits. Today's lecture and topic will be wetland mitigation and the art of creating a water budget. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speakers today, Jennifer Van Hatten and Stephen Stone. Ms. Van Hatten has 26 years of experience in environmental consulting with a specialization in wetlands and water resource management for both the private and public sectors. She manages Davies Mitigation, Wetland, Stream, and Nutrient Mitigation Banks. Her other duties include on-site assessments for potential wetland and stream mitigation opportunities, coordination of wetland, stream, and nutrient credit sales, credit sales management for non davy mitigation-owned banks, giving presentations on the topic of mitigation and stream wetland banking and leading tours of Davy Mitigation's created wetland and stream mitigation banks. During her tenure, she's worked on more than 400 projects and created 20 wetland or restored stream sites and nutrient conversion projects. Mr. Stone has been with WSSI since 2017 and actively working on improving wetland water budgets since 2013. When he began graduate research funded by the Resource Protection Group on WetBud, a wetland water budget modeling software package. He has verified the software's calculations through comparisons against manually calculated versions and field data, revised a user manual and developed video tutorials, and developed a routine for comparing model output from wetlands with variable topography to target hydro periods for various plant communities and specific elevations within the proposed site. So typical duties at WSSI include assessment of potential mitigation sites, design coordination, groundwater studies, and restoration of construction-related impacts to wetlands and streams. And with that, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Jen. Thank you, Jen. So our agenda today is a brief review of the Clean Water Act and 2008 mitigation rule, parameters for a successful site, and then Stephen will be diving into water budget basics, case study, and conclusions with questions at the end. Um, before I jump into the mitigation rule, um, I know we're all familiar with the Clean Water Act, um, but just some history here. It was signed into law in 1972 and provided the basic structure for protecting water quality and regulating discharges into waters of the US. So through a series of amendments over the years, the law was strengthened to include requirements for when compensatory mitigation would be required. And that started in 1977. Uh, mitigation require, wasn't required until you were above 10 acres of impacts to wetlands and streams below the headwaters. It was since amended over the years, and the last one was in 2002 um, to have impacts over a tenth of an acre um, or 300 linear feet of stream. So back in the 70s, the wetlands and the streams were combined um, for the acreage of the threshold, and it, by 2002, they had separated that out. So it's a tenth of an acre of wetlands or 300 linear feet of stream, anything over either of those will require compensatory mitigation. Um, if you're below that threshold, it's called a reporting only permit and they typically do not require mitigation, but that is something that is determined by your regulatory representative. Um, during, during the permitting, oops, go back one. During the permitting process, um, you must demonstrate avoidance and minimization to the maximum extent practicable. 
Uh, this is just an example here of a development plan showing a road impact um, that is something that can be argued that it's necessary, you know, in order to support the development. Um, probably this road was in the county comp plan as a proffer. It's connecting um, to another series of already existing road networks. And these are the impacts associated with um, this road crossing here. You have some impacts to Horse Spin Run and some emergent wetland impacts here. Um, you also must demonstrate that your project is the least environmentally damaging practicable alternative, the LEDPA. And once you have demonstrated that, and you've also demonstrated to the agencies that you've avoided and minimized impacts to the maximum extent practicable, um, anything over that one-tenth of an acre, 300 linear feet, um, that's remaining will require compensation. Those would be considered your unavoidable impacts. So the 2008 mitigation rule um, established the hierarchy of how to provide that compensatory mitigation. And the first option is purchasing bank credits from an approved mitigation bank that is located within the primary service area of your project. The second would be in lieu fee um, through the Virginia Aquatic Resources Trust Fund, the VARDF, followed by permitting responsible mitigation. And what we're gonna be talking about today is really a wetland mitigation site that could be used for either a mitigation bank or your permitting responsible mitigation. So the components of a mitigation banking instrument, um, you have your bank site, and then that's followed by your mitigation banking instrument, which is basically the agreement between the bank sponsor and the regulatory agencies that describe um, how you're gonna keep the bank in compliance. And that will include uh, documents such as the bank operations plan, financial assurances, monitoring maintenance requirements, long-term steward, long-term management plan, invasive species inventory map. Um, that's basically the, the bulk of your MBI. Uh, there is a lot of great information on the banking process on Ribbits, which is this link down here at the bottom of the screen. It is an online database that was created by the Core and DEQ that tracks all proposed banks in the country. And there's also some information there. You can actually search by core district. Um, and then usually each core district will have a separate area to the left that will have bank resources, um, such as templates, guidance documents on um, how to establish a bank in your area. Uh, the interagency review team is who you're gonna be coordinating with to get your wetland mitigation site approved. And that is a number of regulatory agencies, including the Corps of Engineers, DEQ, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, DCR, DWR, NOAA, VMRC. Uh, there's a lot of agencies there, the EPA, that you're going to be coordinating with on this. And your service area, which is basically going to define where you can provide credits um, in that watershed. So your service area is going to be defined by um, what river shed you're located in. For example, the Potomac River, the James River, the York River, and then that will be further defined by what physiographic province you are in. Um, and then you will locate your hydrologic unit codes in that physiographic province, and that is going to define your primary service area. So reviewing potential sites for mitigation. So you're on the search for a mitigation site to create a wetland. Uh, we do the following data. Um, a hydrologic Unicode service area map. Uh, this, you know, if you're looking at creating a wetland mitigation area to sell credits, you want to try to obviously find an area that the credits are in demand. Um, so you wanna define your primary service area based on that. Uh, your parcel ID map is going to tell you who owns the parcel. You'll be able to look up your parcel ID on a couple of other different platforms to determine if there's any existing easements or encumbrances that could potentially thwart your project or you know, come up with issues um, during the process. Your vicinity map, is uh, going to give you some idea of what 
is around your site in terms of development. Um, this example here on the screen is showing Washington Dulles Airport is in close proximity to this site. And the site wasn't necessarily looked at for a mitigation bank, but I believe it was investigated for potential permitting responsible mitigation. Um, the airport here, you know, there's going to be restrictions creating a wetland close to an airport. And you'll have to look at the FAA guidance. And then also sometimes the county or the airport itself will have separate guidance um, that will describe uh, what can be built within a certain distance of the airport. And wetlands are obviously something that are frowned upon in close proximity due to the attractant of birds. You can also on your vicinity map, identify areas that could be potential wildlife corridors such as parkland habitat. So on this example here, you can see there is um, some green space adjacent to the site, which is very uh, valuable in terms of creating your mitigation area. You want something that is going to ideally create a larger swath of habitat for wildlife. Your USGS topographic map, or better, sometimes you can get good county topo, or even better than that, uh, if they have some counties will actually do flies, flyovers, and have really precise topographic data available. Uh, but that's going to tell you the lay of the land on your site, um, if it's going to have any potential at all, um, or if it's you know steeply sloped, uh, where could be potential drainages be that you could capture water from. Mapped soils is also important to determine how well drained your soils are. You know, are they poorly drained? You're, you're looking at creating a wetland site. You want something that's poorly drained. Um, so the soils map is something you definitely want to check out. Your national wetland inventory map can also be very helpful for uh, determining if you have existing wetlands already on that site. You know, this is a desktop review. So you haven't been to the site yet. You're just trying to collect information on what would help you determine, is this worth a site visit? Is it worth pursuing? If you have existing wetlands, um, that could be valuable uh, for further expanding that footprint. Um, alternatively, if it's if the whole floodplain is a wetland, then it's likely not going to be suitable for a mitigation site. And I'll get into that in the next slide. Um, your sulfide hazard map for Virginia, that's something you want to consider. They're not widespread, but they are in a few areas in Virginia, particularly outside of Fredericksburg. And once exposed, those become sulfuric acid, and it will be extremely difficult and costly to get anything to grow in that area. So I definitely recommend looking at that one. Your FEMA floodplain map is also going to identify, you know, your floodplain areas, which from a wetland perspective, that's the ideal location to actually reestablish a wetland. Uh, cultural resources map and ETS. I don't have that in here, but those are something you will have to coordinate through this process. It is still considered a development project and knowing what kind of cultural resources might be present on your site or ETS uh, will save you from potential project delays in the future. Historic aerial imagery is also good to look at uh, to get an idea of what kind of changes has happened to your site over the years. You know, was it always in agriculture? Was it was it logged many years ago? Were there any farm ponds that were installed, and you know, have they since been filled in? Um, those are that's all really good information that will help you in your desktop review. So, what makes a poor mitigation site? Um, no floodplain. So, when you're thinking about wetland creation, you know, the driving factor here is the water, and if you end up you know, looking at a site that doesn't really have any drainages on it, there's no seepage, the soil is really well drained, um, there is no floodplain identified, it's probably going to be a pretty difficult site to get anything established in terms of a wetland on there. Uh, percentage of existing wetlands. So as I mentioned before, some wetlands in your floodplain are great. You know, a lot of times you can find these fields that are, have been impacted by cattle. They have existing wetlands that have impact, been impacted by cattle. And those are always really great, you know, for reestablishment enhancement. Um, but you have to be careful of the ratio. So if you have an entire site that is wetland, um, that will not make for a bank. 
Um, the guidance says that 80% of your credits that are generated must be through wetland creation or restoration. Uh, the other 20% can be wetland preservation. So when you're looking for a site and you notice it does have wetlands on it, um, it's okay, but you wanna also make sure that that ratio, you can capture that 80-20 ratio. Proximity of streams, again, you know, you're thinking of a water source. So you wanna look to see, you know, where is your water gonna be coming from? You know, is it is it in a floodplain of a perennial stream? Do you have seeps? Uh, your soils, if you have something that's well-drained, it's gonna be very difficult to establish a wetland in that area and costly. You know, you'd be thinking about a clay liner. Uh, so the simpler you can make it on yourself, the better. Um, slopes, again, the flatter, the better. Um, if you have something that is very, it's gonna take a lot of grading and earthwork, um, that's gonna, again, drive up your costs. So if you can find something that requires very little earth moving, that will help your bottom line. And vegetation, if you have something that's already forested, the agencies will not support deforestation and tearing down trees to try to create a wetland system. So ideally when you're looking for a site, you want it to be an open field um, with very little trees. So a good mitigation site, it's not so cut and dry, um, but generally if you're talking for like a mitigation bank for a wetland, um, you want something that's fairly large, anything over 20 acres, um, would be good for a bank. Um, if you're looking at PRM, that's probably going to be more need specific. It might not need to be that large, but again, it's it's basically a cost a cost acreage ratio um, of how many credits you can generate and what the cost is to create the bank. Um, you want sites with physical characteristics that are suitable for restoration enhancement while also being cost effective. So. If you have existing soils that don't drain well, as I mentioned, that can that can really drive your costs up and it will not make for a cost-effective site. Uh, if you have easy access to the floodplain, poorly, drain, poorly drained soils, something that's located next to a perennial stream, um, relatively flat topography, open field, those are gonna be um, characteristics that will help you keep your costs down. And then lastly, you want agency buy-in. So before you get too far along in the process, and you've identified a site uh, and you have also coordinated with the landowner, your next step would be to run it past the agencies first before you get too far down in your process uh, to make sure that they are in agreement with the area becoming a wetland mitigation site. And assuming now that you've gotten your, you've gotten land under contract, you've done your due diligence, you've done the delineation, and you've determined that it is a good site to create wetlands, the next step then is to work on your design and start with your water budget. And this is where Stephen will, will jump in. All right, let me get my screen shared here. Okay, we should pick up where Jen left off. So we found the site. Um, the next big questions that you want to address are, you know, where are you going to get the water to, to make this thing a wetland? And how much water will be available and when? And when you're thinking about that, you also need to be considering, you know, um, what is your target plant community? Because the depth and duration of flooding kind of affects what plants you're shooting for. So you need to be keeping that in mind as well. Uh, we've been addressing these questions using water budgets. So conceptually we have a, a water budget is an analytical model that sums inputs and outputs. So we have uh, inputs like precipitation, surface water runoff from a contributing drainage area, potentially groundwater input, an overbank flow, depending on your proximity to a stream, and losses attributed to things like evapotranspiration, uh, surface water out through an outlet weir or um, you know wherever it may leave the site. Uh, groundwater output is often seepage through soils, and you sum all of those up, and you can estimate uh, a projected water level in your site, uh, usually on a monthly basis. And 
keeping with this, you know, the conceptual model for your site is that it's basically a box that water can move in and out of. And sometimes it's been portrayed as a leaky bathtub or maybe like a bowl with a sponge at the bottom where the sponge represents soil that has some available porosity, but the water moves in and out. And uh, based on the weather data, you come up with an approximation of the water level within that box. So in developing your concept for your site, you should you need to parameterize the site and uh, you're, you're defining the boundaries of that box. So start with your constructed wetland area. This, that defines the surface area of your box. Um, you also need to consider the existing wetland area. It's, it's included in the surface area of the box, but it's considered differently for crediting purposes. Um, and then you need the average depth of water in that box. And so you would derive that from a stage storage curve where you look at the volume of water available at each elevation interval. And then you take that total volume, divide it by the surface area of your box. And that gives you an average depth of water in the site. Uh, we do that because the water budgets are estimated or calculated uni using units of length, so inches of water added or subtracted each month. Uh, you also need your contributing drainage area. And one thing that's different about a contributing drainage area for a wetland compared to like a stream assessment is that the contributing drainage area does not go to the pour point or the outlet of your wetland system. It, it is the total drainage area minus the surface area of your constructed wetland or uh, the surface area of your wetland box. Uh, that matters because you don't want to count an input twice. Um, you have precipitation will fall directly on the wetland, but the surface runoff occurs at every point up to uh, the perimeter of your wetland. And the last piece is the location. You know, where is this box in space? Because that's going to define your weather data that you will use to calculate your wetland water budget. Uh, so this method is something, you know, the foundation for this method was laid by uh, Gary Pierce and Mal Gilbert. And they did work that said, you know, if, if you can define this box and you have a weather station, you can take the daily precipitation. And if you've got the curve number and drainage area of your runoff of your um, contributing drainage area, you can estimate the runoff that comes in. You can use a simple potential evapotranspiration estimator like Thornthwaite uh, to come up with the potential loss each month to evapotranspiration. Uh, and that one's pretty easy because it just uses monthly temperatures. If you've observed groundwater seepage or measured groundwater input, you can include that in your infiltration estimate, or you can use some type of an average as an estimate to, to say, you know, we think that the site is going to get this minimal amount of groundwater input. Um, so we're gonna include that in the water budget. Soil permeability is often your estimate of exfiltration or seepage lost. And then you sum all of those up and you get your projected water elevation. And in this example, you can see that uh, our projected water elevation is the line crossing the screen. And it looks like we've got several inches of inundation through June. So we'll meet our hydrology requirements, the water levels drop off a little bit and then they recover in the fall. So all of that looks good. That's, a, that's a, an ideal hydrograph for your water budget. Um, this method works really well and it has created a lot of successful wetlands, um, but sometimes they end up too wet or too dry. And that's often because of the users that are, are um, running these models and, and putting them together, you know, it's often a problem where they may not use the best weather data available, or they have some type of assumption in their model that is not the best representation of a conceptual model for the site. Um, they may be duplicating that input from runoff and precipitation and overestimating the water. And because everyone's generating their own water budgets and documenting it differently, it can be difficult for agencies to review them uh, apples to apples and see where the faults may be. So to address these issues, um, Mike Rollband of the Resource Protection Group and formerly Wetland Studies and Solutions put out an RFP to improve wetland water budget modeling. And the team that won the contract was composed of scientists from Virginia Tech, Old Dominion University, and the University of Kentucky. And the result is a software package called WetBud. Uh, you guys may have heard of it. Uh, it's 
it's a pretty outstanding package, at least we think so. Um, I'll provide a link for it. It is free. So you guys can download that later if you'd like. Um, but really, it's a tool to help people develop more successful rutland restoration and creation plans and a tool for regulators to be able to assess them because it produces a standardized report. All right. Um, the first thing that we did with WetBud was try and improve the availability of weather data. So we looked at NOAA weather stations and uh, precipitation di distributions, physiographic provinces, and then did a Tyson type analysis to come up with suggested influence areas for weather stations. And each of the weather stations on this map, all 130 some odd of them, uh, had at least 30 years of continuous data that we've checked. And that data includes both precipitation and a number of weather parameters so you can calculate potential evapotranspiration using a couple of different routines. Um, the next challenge is how are you going to determine typical dry, normal, and wet years? And that's what this DNW up at the top of the screen is. So when you're estimating a water budget, you want to project different conditions and see if your wetland site will be successful. So you want a typical dry year, a typical normal year, and a typical wet year. And historically, that decision has been made using best professional judgment, that BPJ up at the top there. Um, <clears throat> Some folks are better at it than others. So we suggested that we incorporate a statistical method developed by uh, John McLeod at ODU. And in this method, you take the 30 year record of annual precipitation that we've included, you rank the years on total precip and then apply splits to determine dry, normal and wet ranges. And then you evaluate the median year in each of those ranges to determine if the spring has a matching annual condition to uh, that precipitation con condition. So we want wet years to also have wet springs. This statistical method will look at um, the start of the growing season and make sure that we're starting with a wet condition. You know, we don't have a precipitation data set that says, oh, well, it was a very wet year, but it turns out most of that wet, most of that rainfall came from uh, perhaps like a, a heavy hurricane season or something like that. So we get the spring condition to match the annual condition, and that gives us a good starting point for a typical dry, normal, or wet year. And then another piece of the water budget that can be difficult to include is groundwater input. And uh, we're not doing any real magic here. You know, when we calculate that discharge, we do it the same way everyone else does using Darcy's law. But the innovation comes from including um, the effective monthly recharge model developed by Rich Whitaker. And this model allows you to install two monitoring wells adjacent to your site, um, use a short, relatively short calibration period, six months to 18 months. I mean, the idea is you want to capture the full range seasonal variability of water table elevations at that site. And then you, during that time, you're, you're documenting Water, ele water table elevations, you're measuring precipitation, and you're calculating potential evapotranspiration, you can develop an, a calibrated equation that allows you to recreate hydrographs using the 30 years of weather data that's been packaged with WetBud. So a relatively short calibration period, six months, maybe a year, and then you can use all of that data that we have available so you can project a water table elevation from 30 years ago. Uh, overbank flow is another difficult thing to document well. There are a number of different approaches. Uh, so in WetBud, we have included several common approaches to calculating overbank flow. And we've standardized the documentation for it and made it so that WetBud will um, reference the same precipitation data that you're using for your wetland water budget to calculate the flow in the stream. And that way your uh, potential overbank flow events are synced up with your weather data that you're actually using actually using in your water budget. Uh, the geometry is all well-defined and easy for regulators to review uh, and easy for them to determine how accurate it, your representation is. When you put all that together, the result is a hydrograph. And so we have the bars that represent inputs and outputs. 
uh, we have a couple of lines on here. So we have a pink line, that's the total water. When you simply sum the inputs and outputs, that's your total water. The red line is the actual level of the water and that's been adjusted for soil porosity. So when you think back to that conceptual model I mentioned at the beginning um, with the sponge in the bowl, that's the water moving through that available pore space in the soil and then making its recovery. And then the other two lines, the blue line and the green line are relatively new additions to WEPUD and that's the hydro period. And that's the, the typical annual range of ponding or soil saturation. Uh, it's unique to the plant community that you're shooting for and um, uni unique to different physiographic provinces and geologic settings and whatnot. But we have incorporated a series of reference hydroperiods into WEPUD, and this was developed by Lee Daniels and Ethan Sneesby down at Virginia Tech. They looked at data from 14 different sites, uh, monitoring well data from 14 sites provided by a number of different agencies, uh, Corps of Engineers and others. And they took several years of monitoring well data for each site and overlaid them on an annual basis, on a calendar year basis, and then looked at the maximum and minimum observed water levels for each of those months to determine what is an acceptable range of water levels for those different plant communities. Uh, those 14 reference sites were then incorporated into WetBud. So, you have your Cowardin classification, you can get a sense of what type of wetland was mod or, um, <clears throat> monitored. And then you have a short description, but if you go into the WetBud manual, we have descriptions of each of these sites. So you have a better understanding of the plant community and the geologic setting. And then the well data has been adjusted so that everything is relative to zero, which would be the ground level in your wetland water budget. And it can be adjusted to whatever elevation is appropriate for your site. So now that we've got all of these pieces, we've got a good idea of how we can create our water budgets. Um, so some key points before we get into the case study, having a good conceptual understanding of your site is critical. You need to have a good idea of how these inputs and outputs affect your site, how you're going to parameterize them and the anticipated effect on the water budget. Um, a concept that can often be tr difficult for people when they're putting water budgets together is what is what is conservative. Oftentimes, um, engineers, when they think of something that's conservative, it's the most available water for some type of situation. And in a wetland water budget, the conservative approach is to take the least amount of reliable input to your site and calculate your water budget to see if under the driest conditions or most reasonable dry conditions, will your, your site have the target hydro period that you're looking for. Another point to consider is that water budget modeling should be iterative. Um, you should be thinking about it from the first time you set foot on the site and then revising your water budget every time you adjust the grading or other some other aspect of it. So you, you walk the site and say, oh, well, I think the drainage area is gonna look like this. You, you assess that and you determine if it's been truncated in some way or diverted through a, a culvert. Um, you adjust as you develop a grading plan, you rerun your water budget and see, okay, well, based on this average depth, I think I'll have water for this portion of the year. If you adjust it to work out your cut fill differently or perhaps incorporate some pools, run a new water budget, uh, always keeping in mind that you're just, you're trying to consider that target hydro period for the plant community you want to, to have thrive at the site is the water available at the right times of the year in the right quantities. All right, so let's jump into our case study and see how we apply these, these concepts. So how do we take a site that looks something like this where we've got, yeah, we've got, we've got some wetlands on site, but we also got some terrain that we would want to adjust. And perhaps we want to make it look something more like this where we've got a lot of available water storage. We've got a diverse uh, plant community. So let's take a look at our conceptual site here, our, our case study site. So this is a site we call Stump Town. It's located in Loudoun, Virginia, Loudoun County. It's approximately 90 acres. Uh, it's partially forested and there's a fair amount of fallow field out there. We are actively working on this site. Uh, we hope to go to construction within the next few months or so, but uh, one thing we didn't really talk about a lot is that this process can be pretty slow. So it, it, it can take a while. Um, 
<clears throat> when you look at the terrain, we have drainage that goes from west to east. We have a stream on the eastern boundary and the site is dotted with little pools. And interestingly enough, these pools are often in uphill locations. So that's, that's kind of cool. Let's see what we can learn about those. Um, establishing our, our desktop recon. Um, throughout this process, we identify you know, areas with high potential wetland locations, or like high potential for wetlands. Um, we also identify an area where we think we could create wetlands. And we use this information to go and guide our field reconnaissance of the site. So once we're in the field, <clears throat> we do some test bits. And these are usually pretty shallow, which is a hand auger, get a sense of what the soil looks like. And then we take all of that, we kind of put it together and see, well, what can we do with the site? And it turns out at this one, the stream was a no-go. We are not going to pursue that for restoration. Um, it is in size, it would benefit from restoration, but the proximity to the community to the right makes it a little difficult to pursue. But we do think there's a good possibility of creating wetlands on the east side of the site. So the next piece is that we need to better understand are, you know, what are the soils like in that area? And with all of these pools throughout the site, is there some kind of groundwater component? So the first thing we did was we installed monitoring wells and determined pretty quickly that there wasn't a significant groundwater contribution. Um, it turns out that there's an extensive clay layer down in that potential wetland creation area, which is great for wetlands. It just means eh, we're, we're not going to include um, a groundwater component, so that's okay. Uh, as I said, you know, we found that clay layer. We, did, we took some samples and sent them off to do permeability testing, get a better sense of the texture. Uh, and it turns out it was really great clay. Uh, in fact, the average hydraulic saturated conductivity was 3.9 times 10 to the negative seven centimeters per second. And if you don't think in those kind of numbers, that's about four tenths of an inch per month. So very, very tight, slow moving soil, uh, with slow facilitation of water movement. Perfect for wetlands. So thinking about our conceptual model for this site, uh, we will definitely include precipitation for any wetland that we model out there. We'll have a surface water input. Um, the drainage areas are all connected and everything is good there. We don't have groundwater. We determine that through our monitoring wells. Uh, we will not include overbank flow. The stream is detached, is, you know, it could have some overbank flow, but it's not reliably going to contribute to the water budget. So that conservative assumption is don't include it at all. Um, <clears throat> We will include evapotranspiration. There will be some surface water output through a series of weirs or whatever else we put out at the site. The groundwater output we measured from the soil permeability at four tenths of an inch per month. We'll sum all of those up and that'll give us our water budget. So looking at the conceptual plan, uh, we're going to, oh, I should note that the map has been rotated now and north is out to the right side of the screen. And you can see our shaded polygons are the areas where we have the proposed grading. We're going to mimic the existing conditions and create a series of small pools, shallow pools with an average depth of around six inches. Some will be more, some will be less, but that's the general idea throughout the site. The water, the wetland systems will be surface driven. Uh, as we said, there's you know, no real groundwater component, at least not as an input. And then as we work our way down in this system, we will need to include the output from upstream cells into downstream cells for the water budget. Uh, so how does that work? Well, for each cell on the site, we will need to create a wetland water budget. Um, looking at cell five, which is the one I have highlighted here, you know, you, that cell has its own drainage area. It has a surface area. We know the average depth, and so we can calculate the water budget for it. And then the outflow from that site will be feeding the cell downstream of it. So we take the outflow from cell five, which is a, has units of length and inches of depth, multiply it by the surface area of cell five, and that gives us an outflow volume. Then we take that outflow volume and divide it by the surface area of the downstream cell, which gives us a monthly input that we can use in the water budget. We do that for all of the subsequent cells and we can develop our water budgets uh, as we work our way downstream. 
you'll notice that I'm not doing this until we start um, going into cell six. You know, there are cells that contri could contribute um, drain, you know, outflow into cell five or into cell six based on the drainage area. But it, that outflow could also be absorbed into the soil or depending on how the grading grows, it may not go where we think it's going to. So the conservative approach is to not include it in the water budget. Only when we have this direct connection where the weirs outflow from one cell directly into another will I include this type of input. All right, so let's take a look at the, um, the report that's generated by WetBud. So each report is going to start with um, a project description. It says, okay, this is our Stumptown Mitigation Bank. This is where it's located. Based on that location, this is the reference weather station we are going to use. We're referencing Washington Dulles International Airport. And the weather, that weather station's typical dry, normal, and wet years are 2002, 1974, and 1983, respectively. And then the report defines our box, how we've parameterized the box. So we have a um, constructed wetland area, existing wetland area, um, the, the contributing drainage area, and whatnot. Uh, we do account for soil storage here. You can see that value is 0 0.25. That's usually porosity. You can include a surface storage factor. So if you have really dense vegetation, you can adjust that a little bit. But that's usually not, that's a, usually a value between like 0.95 and 1. That's, that's this piece here. And then based on these parameters, we've determined that the um, average depth in that cell is 5.27 inches. Um, from there, all of the inputs are tabulated, so you can determine how the WEPA, uh, how the um, water budget is calculated. You can see all of the equations that are used to define the different parameters. So runoff, we have our runoff equation. Um, we've cited that the calculation for potential evapotranspiration is being completed using the Thornthwaite equation. We have the, the monthly inputs tabulated as well. And then as you work your way down the report, you'll find the projected water levels. All of the results are tabulated and graphed. I'll show you the graph in a moment. But interpreting this, this, these results, um, the input, we have the input listed first. We have an initial fill at the beginning of the, the modeled period. And that is an assumption that says the wetland is full at the start of the year because it should have filled up with all of the winter rainfall and, and low ET rates, we should have a lot of water available at the start of the year. Then we're going to add precipitation. So the precipitation comes from our weather station. We've estimated runoff based on the calculation on the um, drainage area. And we have our user input. This is the water budget for cell six. So it says the water that came out of cell five is available as a user input into cell six. And then we look at the output, the losses uh, potential sources of loss for the wetland. Um, we're losing about a quarter of an inch every month, or in January at least, to evapotranspiration, or four tenths of an inch per month for the groundwater out. And then when you sum the inputs and the outputs, you have this outflow that's excess water in the system going to the next cell. So this is where we would use the outflow, multiply it by the surface area of the downstream cell, and calculate a new user in for cell seven. The water budget then sums it up and projects our water levels, and it looks like this. So we have our, our um, hydrograph. This is the normal year, and so a, a lot like our example earlier, um, we have a relatively full system all the way through June, so we'll meet our hydrology requirements. The water doesn't quite drop down to the soil level. Um, we still have a little bit of inundation, two inches or so throughout the site through most of the summer, and then it makes a full recovery in the winter. So that works out well for our target hydro period for that site. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. That's the, how you would use all of those inputs and outputs to create a water budget. Um, you know, of course the report would include your dry year and wet year, but not really necessary for the presentation. So um, moving on, I'd say some of the things to consider, you know, as Jen said, we've got our created and restored wetlands. They, they can be used to mitigate impacts from new development. Um, 
but it's critical that you scout good sites and understand the conceptual model for those desired systems. You know, it takes some, takes some good field work and um, desktop analysis. And then you, you need to use good data for your models. And that's, that's where this picture comes from. Our, our faithful leader here, Mike Rollband, um, this was out at a site in Northern Virginia where we had a sealed double ring infiltrometer to try and get a, an accurate field measurement of infiltration. Um, I don't recommend this. It's not as much fun as he makes it look, but um, it worked. And then <clears throat> once you've got good data, you need to select the appropriate tools to implement your conceptual model. And then it's really critical as well that you keep learning and, and testing your models and, and going out and revising them. Um, so one set of tools I'd like to recommend to, to continue your learning is to go check out our tutorials. Uh, you can use this QR code and the, or the link below and you can find the tutorials and you can find the link to download WebBud. Um, kind of work through each of these things that we've talked about in the presentation today to give you a better understa understanding of how you would actually calculate it in WebBud and the math um, and the research that went into defining it. And with that, I want to acknowledge all of the people that helped make it possible. So uh, the folks from Virginia Tech, ODU, and the University of Kentucky. And that's it. We're, we're ready to take some questions if you guys have any for us. Thank you both. That was wonderful and thought provoking. We're going to move ahead now to the Q&A. Again, I'll be posing your questions and possibly a few of my own uh, that I've received through the Q&A button to the presenters. If you forget to ask a question or have to leave before the Q&A is over, you can email the presenter the email address listed on this slide. All right, Stephen, we have a few questions. So are there any site-specific studies that you need to conduct to develop water budgets? Or is this strictly an analysis of prior data and engineering plans? You can use existing data, not prior analyses, as a starting point, but recognize their faults. If you, uh, you know, soils maps are only so accurate, drainage area mapping, you should walk the perimeter and make sure it's not truncated. So recognize their faults and use it as a starting point. Great. All right, and how how would agricultural drain tiles affect the understanding of a water budget early on? Mm. <laughs> um, when I'm doing test pits, I like to put them where I think there may be drain tiles and try and cut across them with an excavator and see if I find anything. Um, if you're doing soil permeability testing and you come back with a really low rate, but there are drain tiles through there, your exfiltration is is going to be an underestimate. So try and find drain tiles and incorporate breaking them into your design plan. Uh, Jen, we have a question for you here. Uh, so can you still create a mitigation bank on an area where ETS are present? And what are the ramifications of finding ETS on your site? Um, probably would depend on what ETS you have on your property. Um, you know, if you're having, if you have areas that have rare plant communities or endangered and threatened plants um, where you're proposing to, you know, alter that habitat that probably will not get approved. Um, if you alternatively are creating something that would then provide habitat for maybe uh, an endangered mammal species, um, you know, that's the direction you want to go. So it really just depends on what your, what ETS are popping up for you during your search. You know, if you have mussel species in your stream, you know, you're probably going to have a time of year restriction during the development of your wetland site. Um, the same would go for any bats. Um, if you have a uh, proposed tree disturbance anywhere, you're going to have to do your bat studies and um, you potentially could end up having a time of year restriction for that. Um, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, also, another question, how difficult is it to find potential mitigation sites in the coastal plain in areas where the soils are sandy? Um, it can be challenging. You know, I, I, I know for us, at least when we're looking in the coastal plain, if it has sandy soil and it's been ditched, that's usually a good sign that it would support wet conditions. If the soil is sandy and it has not been ditched, it's usually not a very good indicator for us that it would be a suitable site. Um, you know, I think also a lot of soils we're looking at 
in the coastal plain for wet conditions when we see something that is a silty loam that's usually a better indicator rather than going with something that's sandy but again the ditching is usually a pretty dead giveaway um the mineral pots are also good yeah <laughs> um Stephen, do you have any other ideas or comments about that from your work no i think that your point about the drainage ditches, it being a dead giveaway. I mean, you can look at those and oftentimes when you're doing your aerial imagery assessment, you may find that, or your national wetland inventory, that there are wetlands adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, let's, let's get rid of those ditches. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jen. Uh, another question for you, Stephen. Is there a user guide or manual for a wet bed? Oh, there sure is. Uh, <laughs> Kirby Dobbs did the first version, and then I had the pleasure of reworking it and uh, working with the programmer. So um, when you download WetBud, you can go to the help section and get a 300 some odd page help manual. Super easy to read through then, right? Oh, it's a pleasure, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, let's see, we have another question here. So someone asked, I know a big component of the water budgets are indicating a weir height, but what about projects that do not install any weirs? Is this just a depth of your wetland or a depth at the edge? A depth of your wetland or a depth at the edge, absolutely. Yeah, you may not have a weir, but you have a depression most likely. Um, if you don't have a depression, you're looking at some groundwater stuff that's a little more complicated, but generally there's a depression or an invert of some kind that water will flow through when it leaves the site. Thanks. So do you use wet bud for smaller scale mitigation projects or just for the larger mitigation banks? Um, we use wet bud when we are developing this type of wetland water budget model. It's not the only solution to model water levels. Um, you could do groundwater flow models. You can look at um, what is it, models like drain mod when you're removing ditches. There are other approaches, but wet bud is, is a go-to for us. And then maybe this one can be for either of you, but how do you determine what the drainage area is for the wetland is a general question. So you start with the topographic map, um, walk it out. It's you start by looking at it on, on the desktop and you can review aerial imagery and, and sometimes you may find that some piece of it is truncated. It's, they're generally smaller than drainage areas for stream systems and big lakes and stuff like that. So the water budget is very sensitive to the drainage area size. So it's important that you field verify it and make sure that it's an accurate representation. Gotcha. How time consuming is a full wet bud model. Uh, you can make it as long or short as you want to. There's a wizard included with wet bud that allows you to calculate a water budget in less than 15 minutes. Um, when you want to include overbank flow or groundwater flow, uh, that becomes a little more time consuming. And the other challenging part is that it is it is iterative. As you modify that grading plan, you're gonna run it again. Um, but the tools are there to duplicate scenarios and tweak different parameters so you can make modifications quickly. And it, you just run wet bud through the whole time you're designing this, looking at the model and the hydrology, or how often is wet bud run through this process? Um, as I, a couple of times throughout the project, when you make significant changes to a grading plan, it's you you want to do it. But um, as you're tweaking the site, you. You're, as you're tweaking the grading plan, you probably have a good idea of what kind of water is available. But before you submit that final version, you need to run it again with all of the final adjustments that have been made and check it against that target hydro period and run that report so the agencies can easily tell what you've included in your water budget. Okay. We have a lot of uh, water budget questions here. Uh, so can you give any tips for additional design inputs for wetland replication on a site? that does not have groundwater contribution, but seems to have perched water. This is a replication situation, so it has to be done on the site that will be impacted. Um, it sounds like that's an approach where you would probably want to have groundwater wells in place and you are going to recreate 
the water levels that are observed. And you may be looking at a portion of the site adjacent to something that's already wet um, to kind of expand that same topography. Gotcha. All right, and then let's give one more wet bug question here. Can you speak to the point concerning a double ring infiltration test for single ring? Is the double that much more accurate or reliable? Um, the double is much more of a, a pain <laughs> in the rear. <laughs> uh, but the difference is one allows, um, the single ring gives you conductivity in X, Y, and Z directions. The double ring infiltrometer is supposed to give you an estimate only in the vertical component. Um, it's designed to work with soils that have very low permeability rates. So the setup is critical. Uh, you need to have the, the rings entrenched in bentonite and uh, limit their exposure to soil surface. And then, uh, yeah, it's, it's time consuming, it's a very sensitive setup. And like I said, not as much fun as Mike made it out to be. <laughs> he did look like he was having a good time. He was having a ball. <laughs> well, great. Um, I think that's about all the time we have for questions. Steven, Jen, thank you so much. Um, if you guys have any other questions, you could just email either Steven or Jen. And we just want to say we're proud to recognize our webinar series sponsors for this year, including BioApp, Cattails Environmental, Davy Mitigation, and Ducks Unlimited. You can find their information at the websites listed above. Please visit, like, and follow our SWS webinar sponsors. Also, our next webinar will be on October 19th on the latest trends in wetland mitigation baking. We'll then be gathering on November 16th for a presentation on the Ramsar Convention implementation in coastal wetlands of the Caribbean. So don't forget to register. You can check out our website and social media channels to learn more and register for any upcoming events. And don't forget to complete the survey that will be sent to you after this webinar to receive, you'll receive a certificate of participation and be able to provide feedback for us on this webinar series. So thanks again today to our presenters and to our audience for participating. I hope everyone has a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend. Thanks for joining.